Hello there, do hope you're all well. I've, I know the hat's off and the earphones are going to do something a little bit different here. Talk, t I, you know me and my channel. I enjoy listening to Nick Abbott Friday, Saturday nights, especially Friday, Saturday nights, because we all could do with a good giggle. But I do enjoy the Sunday nights. It's uh, has a very, a variety of topics he t talks about. And uh, no, and we all know the the absolute corruption and Tory sleaze got got uh, the first hour and the second hour. He talked about uh, the situation with our borders and the record number of migrants. I'm saying migrants or refugees arrived arriving here from France and how we should tackle the problem humanely. And he and he spoke to a. Uh, uh, immigration lawyer called Harjap Singh Bangal about this matter and what what how could I put it you know you hear the usual right right wing tropes about the coming over here stealing our jobs and our women and practically and all this stuff well he basically put them into questions for for this guy to answer and I thought it was just a really really fantastic interview um. Uh, and I hope we enjoy it because I thought I'll share it with you because I just thought it was really good. Enjoy. Harjap Singh Bangal is an immigration lawyer and joins me now. Uh, Mr. Bangal, thanks for joining us. Well, pleasure. Now, the number of uh, people making the crossing has increased, but the number of asylum claims apparently being made in the UK has decreased. Why is that? Um, this seems to be a, a figure, you know, which doesn't uh, at first tally. Um, probably means because, one, that maybe a few people of these who are actually making a crossing are being sent back. So um, that perhaps they don't, uh, once they get here, they're, they're hit on the Eurodac system and that people realise or the Obama authorities realise that they've claimed asylum before in Europe and they're sent back for the country in which they first came to be dealt with. So that could be one of the reasons. The other reason could be they're making human rights applications instead of asylum applications. Or, in fact, they're not pursuing asylum applications and um, they're seeking other alternatives uh, in relation to staying, making other applications to stay here. So uh, that is uh, the, gen the general sort of consensus and general feeling as to what it is. Also, the other feeling is that perhaps a lot more are now being caught as a spotlight is on people crossing the channel than what they were before. A lot of people before perhaps weren't being caught and were entering clandestine and now the focus is on and a lot more being highlighted in that respect. You know, a lot of people, uh, when this topic comes up, call and uh, want to know why people will cross all of Europe in order to get here. In, in your experience, what, what are the main reasons? Oh, there's quite a few reasons. One is um, perhaps they've already settled communities here um, where their friends are, relatives are, and they thought it would be a lot easier to settle down here in relation to perhaps finding somewhere to stay, um, financial aid from their friends and relatives, as opposed to going to a country where they don't know the language. Language is once again another thing. English is spoken all around the world. It's easier to communicate in English for some people than, say, Spanish or French. Um, the other thing would be that the gangs um, offer to take them there. And they say, well, hold on, we're, we're dispersing people evenly. Obviously, the gangs just don't send to one country. They disperse all across Europe. And uh, we get some of the bulk of what the gangs send over. So there's quite a few reasons why uh, people would want to come to the UK or, or are coming over here. But that's still relatively smaller than what, say, countries like Germany um, take in. Yes, that is um, a, a, an interesting point, isn't it? Because a lot of people get the feeling that... Uh, you know, the world's refugees are all coming here. But what is the truth of that as far as the distribution around the rest of Europe is concerned? Oh, not at all. Not at all. In fact, a, the large number of the world's refugees um, end up in Asian countries. So in, in neighbouring countries, uh, say, you know, countries that neighbour Afghanistan and Iraq, um, Germany takes a vast number when it comes to Europe. Spain, France, once again, take a, take a big number. Austria... Um, we sort of do get the sort of trickle end of things, us being an island and, you know, um, nowhere to go. In fact, if there was, say, if we were actually landlocked between America and Europe and there was no sea there, then perhaps they would pass through Britain and go 
into America. So, you know, it's just the fact that when they reach Britain, they have nowhere to go. And plus us being a small country and already, you know, as a lot of people say, overcrowded, um, perhaps and resources are, have pressure put on, we just feel... And it looks as if Britain is getting uh, the majority of it, but uh, proportionately, we're not at all. And another thing that, that uh, people tend to say when this topic crops up is that um, why should those people come here and get um, a full suite of welfare uh, payments and and a house and, um, you know, uh, uh, all, all of the rest of it? Tell us what life is like for somebody who comes here and then applies for asylum. Um, first of all, they don't actually get benefits. Um, so they don't get a national insurance number. Uh, they're not given permission to work. So that's the fir first thing. Now, without a national insurance number, you can't claim benefits. They're given vouchers or something to survive, and the equivalent of about, say, £50 a week. Housing is provided by the local authority. Now, it's not the asylum seeker's fault that, this, that the local authority have contracted with a British landlord who's, prof who's profiting from this and to say, well, hold on, we will rent four rooms out in your house. Or if there's no housing available, then they have to approach hotels um, and then say, well, hold on, how many rooms do you have available? We've got X amount to house. And remember, they're only offered to support until their claim is decided and once again it is not the fault of the asylum seeker that it takes the home office two years to decide a claim a claim can be decided in half a day yet there's a backlog of over about 60,000 claims that have taken more than a year to be decided that's how broken the home office is that's not the fault of the asylum seeker and once again if there's a family of seven you can't house them in one room or a studio flat you have to find suitable accommodation and once again the local authority is under obligation to provide that, especially where there's children. Now, a lot of asylum seekers seek their own accommodation, like we mentioned before. They go to their friends or relatives who are already here, and they don't even seek any support because they feel that we don't need your vouchers for £40 or whatever. So they, these are big, big myths. And what newspapers tend to do, I mean, to, they tend to highlight one case as opposed to, you know, the hundred that aren't claiming anything. So that's how, how it works. Right. Now, you've um, sort of outlined how difficult and what a long period it uh, is involving uh, claiming asylum. What about these ideas put forward by Pretty Patel and the Home Office of um, taking the asylum process and putting it on an island in the uh, middle of nowhere? What do you think about that? I don't think that's going to really deter people from coming here. And... Um, I've been an immigration lawyer for 20 years, and my first in my first year, my job was literally to go to detention centres and see asylum seekers, and they get using the same routes. I used to go to Dover then. They're coming at Dover now. They came from Calais then. They came from Calais now. You know, the routes are the same, and it's quite. I'm quite amazed that in the 20 years, we cannot stop people using the same routes, and the gangs are operating with almost immunity when's the last time i mean let's take this year out when's the last time before that you heard of big people smuggling gangs getting lifetime sentences yet you hear of a war on drugs every week every week we can read about drug dealers being taken down and sentenced to life i think people have got to understand there's more money made in people smuggling than there is in drug smuggling and i think that, that needs to sink in and once people realize that this is the size of the criminality that you're dealing with these gangs have got people on the payroll. There is no way that you can come from Moscow to, say, France by foot and in a gang of, in a group of 30 without getting stopped at a border anywhere. There's no way you couldn't probably do it. I couldn't do it. So how are these gangs doing it? So obviously there's people on the payroll and there's people and they're well connected right up until the point that they get into the UK. And we've seen them use various routes. You know, um, but essentially the same ones at ports. There's only a certain number of ports in the UK where they can come in. And I'm surprised in 20 years we haven't actually locked them down and sealed them off and realised that, you know, in relation to realise where these gangs are operating from and followed these gangs about. Instead, it, you know, we seem to be concentrating on blaming the asylum seekers and saying, well, hold on, oh, what they're doing is actually criminal. That's almost like blaming a, dr dr um, a drug user for drug dealers being around and trying to say well actually it's the drug users fault 
actually, it's the fault of the police and it's the fault of the border forces. It's not the drug user's job to catch the drug dealer. Well, and it's, it's very it's, difficult for our authorities, isn't it, to prevent them from pushing off from the coast of France. So what um, is the truth about the uh, allegations being levelled at the French for um, allowing this to happen or encouraging it or just by not uh, uh, you know, acting strongly to prevent it, uh, uh, allowing it to happen? It's it's equivalent of, you know, you. this is where diplomacy comes in. What have we got MPs for? What have we? What did we have MPs in the European Parliament for? It was to do this. It was to negotiate these sort of issues out of there. And if they're not doing it, then why are they blaming the asylum seekers? Surely it's the MPs and the government that have failed to negotiate. It's not people like me or you or the asylum seekers who's going to go and negotiate with the authorities. It's the MPs that have to do it. And what's happening recently hasn't helped. We've seen a lot of levelling of blame. And it's almost like if you've got people trampling through your back or through a series of back gardens on your road, you know, and you're asking your neighbour to stop them and slipping them a tenner, and it's up to the neighbour to say, well, hold on, do I stop them? What's the duty on me to stop them? I'm getting my fair share of people trampling on mine. Why can't? Why don't you want people trampling in your garden? So it, the essential is you can't, we can't rely on other people to do our mm-hmm. job. We're an island, and if we can't protect our borders, then, you know, uh, how, how can we expect other countries to expect to protect them for us? We've prided ourselves on being fortress Britain, island Britain. You know, that, no, no one can get in. We're secure. We have a large navy. You know, we have a massive police system. And yet uh, we have one of the worst uh, border, border forces, you know, I, I've, I've ever seen. Um, we have one of the worst home offices. They, they can't even get their decisions right. I, there was a case uh, about four or five years ago where they had to hire gap year students in their holidays to make decisions. So they've got staffing problems and, you know, the whole system is broken. And what do we do every year? We get a select committee report which says this home office is no good, it's not fit for purpose. We decide to paint over the cracks. We need to demolish the wall and rebuild it. Has Brexit actually made it more difficult to prevent people coming here in small boats from France? I don't think it's made people more. I don't think it's made a difference for people to coming um, over. And I think the figures show that. And I think uh, a lot of your listeners will agree that um, they thought that Brexit would stop all this. But in fact, it hasn't. So perhaps they were sold a lie saying, well, hold on, we can control our borders. Where is the control on the border? I don't see it happening. And I'm sure your listeners don't um, see it happening either. So I, I don't think it's made it harder for them to come over. I think the focus is now on a lot on immigration. I think uh, immigration control was one of the key issues of Brexit and the public are now rightly so focused on that, saying, well, hold on, where is the deliverance on this promise that you've made? And all we get told is, no, we're dealing with it. Oh, don't worry, Pretty Patel's on the case, Boris Johnson's on the case. And, you know, what we've seen is absolutely none of the measures taken have worked or do work and until we deal with the root causes of these issues is why people leave their countries why are they displaced what support systems have we got for them in their countries why do we go over or why do countries go over there and invade other countries and create situations like this and we're not really going to see that you can't blame someone for fleeing a war-torn country when all they see around them is death and destruction and their kids are being killed if our kids were being killed and bombed and shot in front of our eyes we'd want to move too yeah. we'd want to leave as well and it, rightly so we'd want to go to a safe place or we'd want to go somewhere where we feel secure and uh, um, britain is a country in which they feel secure in. and europe in europe they feel secure in. and it's not just everyone leaves from germany to come here they don't like I said, Germany can take the majority of the brunt. That's true. Um, good to talk to you. That's Hajap Singh Bangal, an immigration lawyer. Asylum seekers, that was the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> yeah, when I got on about migrants and refugees and stuff like that, I was, want the word I was, words I was thinking of. Asylum seeker just won't come into my head. <sighs> so how bad I am at this. But yeah, I just liked it because... Basically saying, well, you hear all this stuff people saying about uh, why are they all coming here and all that stuff. And the guy, being in the business for 20 years, he's so he 
he, pro he knows his, his stuff, doesn't he? He's not the sort of guy who you're going to make behind the counter of your local chipper. <laughs> Serving your cake and chips. He's, he's in the business of um, helping these people. So he bound to know more about it than our Nigel Foghorn Farage while he's shouting at some beach in Dover. And it was really, really good interview. But the thing is, did, do you think uh, our Nick Abbott got one or two of the um, push them all out to see and let them all drown brigade ring in? You bet your bottom dollar he did. Uh, but that's for another video. Uh, anyway, I shall leave the video here. Until the next time, I shall bid you farewell. So take care.